Dr. Ehrman, do we have any historical precedent for crucifixion victims ending up in a later known tomb? I don't know of any instance uh, where we have a verified account of anybody being buried on the afternoon of their crucifixion in a known tomb. So, how likely is it that they made an exception in the case of Jesus? There we have it, folks. No historical cases. Who would be so out of touch as to insist that zero evidence for something is really good evidence for it? Jesus was not the exception to the rule. Taking the bodies down and burying them on the day of crucifixion was the rule that was followed in Judea. Oh boy. Better buckle up, everyone. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Around three months ago, Alex O'Connor, formerly Cosmic Skeptic, hosted Dr. William Lane Craig on his podcast, where the Christian philosopher went on to give one of the weakest defenses of the historicity of Jesus' resurrection that I've seen in a while, followed by a surprising reaction from Alex. I mean, I feel like I haven't challenged you as much as I expected to, but I've just been so interested in, in letting you explain these in their depth because I, I think they're wonderful well, responses. A few months later, Alex sat down with renowned New Testament historian, Dr. Bart Ehrman, and at the tail end of that lengthy conversation... I had an episode with William Lane Craig, and he put forward a historical case for the resurrection of, of Jesus of Nazareth. And I remember in that podcast, I, I sort of listening back had wished that I pushed back a little more. And a lot of people actually noticed and they said, you know, I'm surprised that you didn't really sort of give him a bit more grief for it. Yeah. But I figured that uh, perhaps rather than making a botched attempt at doing it myself, it would be better to, <laughs> to ask you. Cameron Bertuzzi of Capturing Christianity was similarly unimpressed. As I was listening to Dr. Ehrman's responses, I just remember thinking, man, this is, this is just not very good. Like these responses just didn't really strike me. Like, and this wasn't like apologetics, Cameron, like trying to just like come up with some reason why Christianity is true. This was just really honestly, like listening to what he was saying and just being like, man, that's, that's not it. That's not it, chief. He even dragged me into this. I've got the clip pulled up. Let's play the clip from this interview with Apologia. In my probably biased view, Far too much of this latest interview was spent entirely on personal comments about Alex or Bart as individuals, which has nothing to do with the points being raised, and swaths of it being spent battling uncharitable strawman versions of positions. Now, I couldn't blame you if you're thinking this video will be another classic Apologia responseception, and maybe even bringing in Dr. Ehrman to defend himself, but I've done that before, and let's be real. I'm sure I'll do it again in the future. And it's very tempting, because this rubbed me the wrong way. But if I'm being honest, I don't think any of the four men involved, Alex, Bart, Phil, or Cameron, gave us their best in these. A group bad day at the office, as it were. And ultimately, I do want this channel to be focused on the actual scholarship, the actual arguments, the claims of Christians being carefully examined in the light of day. So to that end... What I'm going to do is pull out one topic Dr. Craig spent the most time on, the empty tomb and burial of Jesus, and respond only to his very specific positive case. Of course, that's where we got off on the wrong foot, because Dr. Craig inexplicably shirked any notion that Jesus' burial requires a burden of proof. Ehrman is in the very difficult position of having to disprove the burial account. The person who believes in the empty tomb doesn't need to prove the burial story. He can have other reasons in support of the empty tomb account. But the burial account is the sine qua non of the uh, empty tomb story. If you're going to deny the empty tomb, then you've got to disprove the burial account. That is decidedly not the case. Anyone can justifiably deny the empty tomb merely by saying, I'm not convinced by the evidence for an empty tomb. An empty tomb is literally a positive claim. Normally, Dr. Craig understands burden of proof better than this. In making a claim to knowledge and making a claim to know something, whether it be that there is a God or that there is no God, a person needs to have justification, uh, and that will involve giving evidence and argument. When he uses a word like disprove, 
I fear that Dr. Craig is invoking a notion of certainty that is inappropriate for historical inquiry. Maybe 20 years younger Dr. Craig could help explain this. When historians provide hypotheses for reconstructing the past, I think they're using a form of inductive inference, which is called by philosophers, inference to the best explanation. And what this means is that you're confronted with a body of data to be explained. You then uh, establish a pool of live options for explaining that data. And then on the basis of certain criteria, you assess those rival explanations to determine which explanation, if best, would explain the data in the most plausible way. And that will be the preferred historical explanation that you pick. All right, so let's discuss the fate of Jesus' body after he died on the cross. We'll look at two competing hypotheses and see which is the best explanation. Fortunately, both parties are putting forth entirely natural scenarios, so no supernatural element is required for either, so we can avoid any human entanglements. And let's be clear about this up front. This is not the epistemic standard we're talking about. Almost unanimous opinion of New Testament scholarship that the burial account is credible. I'm fine with someone who thinks that the gospel burial story is credible. Both hypotheses have some level of credibility. But the question today is which is the best explanation? Here's Dr. Craig's idea. After his crucifixion, Jesus was interred in a tomb late on Friday afternoon by a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin named Joseph of Arimathea. And I put forth that Jesus' body was disposed of in a manner such that the location was not later known or could be ascertained by his followers or his enemies. After all, that is true of most crucifixion victims in history. For Roman leadership, the purpose of crucifixion was not primarily punitive, nor retributive, but rather as an overtly public deterrent. First century historian Quintilian explains, Whenever we crucify the condemned, the most crowded roads are chosen, where the most people can see and be moved by this terror. For the penalties relate not so much to retribution as to their exemplary effect. In what remains the preeminent historical survey of the practice of crucifixion, Martin Hengel put it this way, Crucifixion was aggravated further by the fact that quite often its victims were never buried. It was a stereotype picture that the crucified victim served as food for wild beasts and birds of prey. In this way, his humiliation was made complete what it meant for a man in antiquity to be refused burial, and the dishonor which went with it can hardly be appreciated by a modern man. Documentation for this gruesome corpse degradation trope is plentiful, far more than can be covered in a video. Maybe a topic for a book or something. Here are just a few references to Roman burial denial. And here are a few about crucifixion victims ending up as meals for wild animals. Archaeology affirms cremation and mass graves were the go-to disposal when the public display value was over. Keep in mind, these ancient references were not in the context of specialized treaties on crime and punishment. They come from everyday letters, jokes, and journals. The sight of wild animals feeding on the corpses of crucifixion victims, hanging for days on end, was so commonplace in the Roman Empire that it was universally relatable to citizens as a source of populist humor. It's funny because it's true. Well, Absoy, please understand, I'm not making a specific claim that wild dogs necessarily chewed on Jesus' bones while crows plucked his eyes. But it is abundantly clear that anonymous disposal, at very best, was the most common fate. In fact, I've not yet found a Christian historian who disagrees with me on this. Here are renowned resurrection defenders Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona. That was the typical practice of the Romans to do that. That's what happened to most people. Not even Dr. Craig denies this historical fact. So how does he want to make the most likely thing plausibly become the least likely thing? You cannot let Roman practice outside of Judea indicate or dictate uh, what they did in Judea. Okay. So in the first century, 
Judea was a province in the Roman Empire, the province where Jesus died. What Craig is arguing is that general Roman practice doesn't tell us what happened in Judea any more than general Great Britain practice tells us what happens in Wales, or general Canadian practice tells us what happens in Alberta, or general American practice tells us what happens in Texas. And this is valid to some extent. Regional variation is plausible, but absent positive evidence to the contrary, the most reasonable expectation is that what applies to the political whole also applies to the political parts. So, does Dr. Craig have any evidence that first century Judea treated crucifixion victims differently than elsewhere in the empire? Well, what he does not have is any historically documented case of a first century crucifixion victim in Judea being given a tomb burial that could later be identified. That's not quite true. He has Jesus. Jesus is the only first century Judea crucifixion victim who has written claims about the fate of their body. But that's the story we're attempting to corroborate. So not helpful here. Since Dr. Craig has no direct document evidence for his notion of Judea exceptions for body disposal, what support does he put forth? And the Jewish authorities would want the body taken down from the cross before nightfall, especially because of impending Passover, one of the holiest days, because the body left on the cross would defile uh, the land. Oh, I see. The Jewish authorities would want the body taken down by a certain time. I suppose in all those other provinces, people were very happy to have rows of dead bodies on crosses for days on end. A real treat. Remember, for Rome, the penalties relate not so much to retribution as to their exemplary effect. And we're supposed to assume they'd forego that whole purpose because this particular province would prefer otherwise? I don't doubt the Jewish authorities wanted the bodies down. The question is, did they usually get their way on this? And even if they did, Dr. Craig is asking a how question with a when answer. We can assume that the sunset deadline was met and still have no information whatsoever about whether the disposal location was known to his supporters or enemies. Pilate respected Jewish sensibilities uh, in order to keep the peace. Citation needed. And that citation better not be the very story we're attempting to corroborate. Each subsequent retelling of the burial story has Pilate less and less complicit in the death, to the point where second century gospels have Pilate practically a hero. No, this character of the same name is not the Pilate of history. To be charitable to Craig, Tacitus does have one story of Pilate respecting Jewish sensibilities to keep the peace. It was early in his career, and in the cover of night, Pilate hung in Jerusalem banners bearing effigies of Caesar. Of course, this violated Jewish laws prohibiting images depicting gods, and Pilate knew it, which is why it happened at night. When a delegation of Jews complained, Pilate threatened to kill them, but they called his bluff and welcomed death, something he did not expect. This was unsatisfying, so Pilate ultimately took the standards down. This kind of supports Craig's idea, but not really. There are sequels to this story that the apologists rarely tell. A more experienced Pilate started to take temple funds for a water project, again clearly disinterested in Jewish sensibilities. This time, when the same leadership complained, Pilate's men were waiting in disguise and just started indiscriminately murdering and maiming a great number of people, women and children included. Pilate went on to get his revenge for the standard's embarrassment by putting up plain gold shields with an inscription to Caesar rather than a picture, thus violating the spirit of Jewish law, but not the letter. Historian Philo said this was not so much to honor Tiberius, as to annoy the multitude. Philo enumerated the briberies, the insults, the robberies, the outrages and wanton injuries, the executions without trial, constantly repeated, the ceaseless and supremely grievous cruelty of Pilate's conduct, with all his vindictiveness and furious temper. In Luke 13.1, Jesus is told that Pilate killed Galileans and mixed their blood in with the holy sacrifices. This is the man that Craig thinks respected Jewish sensibilities? Really? 
Our surviving literary evidence suggests that the bodies of those who were executed in and around Jerusalem during peacetime were not only permitted to be buried, but were expected to be buried before sundown on the day of death. This was done in order to preserve the purity of the land. That is incorrect and vastly overstating his case. Let me cite a, an important article from the New Testament scholar Craig Evans on the burial of Jesus that is relevant to this. Roman legal material explicitly states that the bodies of the executed, if request is made, can be taken down and given proper burial, and he references De Gesta chapter 48. The De Gesta was compiled 600 years after Jesus' death, and this citation about giving over bodies to non-relatives is from a 3rd century case. A law from 250 years after Jesus died is far less relevant than the practices I cite from the right time. Digesta does have a 1st century reference that Craig could have used instead, where death penalty bodies can be requested, and sometimes this is granted. It allows the possibility, but it specifically states burial is not permitted where the person has been convicted of high treason. Was Jesus convicted of high treason? Pilate allegedly wrote on a sign in several languages that Jesus' crime was being king of the Jews. So that seems pretty conclusively treason. These digesta passages do not help Craig's case at all. Josephus, writing in the 70s, states that in his time, even the bodies of, quote, those sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset, end quote. That's from Jewish War, chapter 4, section 317. This passage, on the other hand, is the best one for Craig's case, as the similarities seem strong on the surface, and the dissimilarities require getting into the weeds a bit. He should have led with this and quoted it directly. Here it is. They, the Edumians, actually went so far in their impiety as to cast out their dead bodies without burial. Although the Jews are so careful about burial rites that even malefactors who've been sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset. Now, as briefly as I can, here's the context. Josephus was a Jew who fought against the Romans during the first Jewish-Roman War, but surrendered and became an advisor to the Roman emperors. This put him in an awkward position as a spy writer of sorts. Historians observe a tension in his writings. Whenever opportunity permits, he tends to cast his own Jewish heritage in the best possible light, while at the same time balancing avoiding directly blaming the Romans for anything. Hyperbole is a well-used tool in the Josephus toolbox. In this passage, Josephus is referring to a common enemy of Jew and Roman alike, the Idumeans. So it's a perfect opportunity to celebrate Jewish moral superiority without insulting any Romans, and it is exactly the kind of context where he's prone to stretch the truth. We can't know for sure if this is an exaggeration, but it's something to keep in mind. Taking the passage at face value, it's important not to read into it more than it actually says. First, Josephus does not say this was always the case, or even usually the case, merely that full burial of crucifixion victims has been known to happen. In this very same document, Josephus tells us that the Romans were crucifying 500 Jews a day in the area of Jerusalem. They would have needed a separate army to get each one into the ground by sundown. Practically, this must be a sometimes occurrence rather than the general rule. Second, we're left to speculate to which time period Josephus is referring. During the war? Before the war? Way back to the Maccabean period? When the Jewish leaders were crucifying other Jews? Without any Roman oversight at all? This passage is written 40 years after Jesus' death. So, any of these answers is plausible. Unfortunately, it is left unsaid. So, we're left to guess if it applies to Jesus' day or not. Third, buried doesn't imply an individual, later identifiable, resting place for each, which is the claim in question. Jews also use ditch graves, and 500 a day 
requires some economies of scale shortcuts to achieve. Finally, Josephus uses the Greek word katadike, translated here into the old-timey word malefactor. You there, fill it up with petroleum distillate and revulcanize my tires post-haste. Seventeen times in his writings, always in the context of broad condemnation, including slavery or dishonor, and never in relation to an enemy of the state. Recall the Digesta passage, which specifically excludes treason from positive treatment. There is more to say, but charitably, I'd concede this passage does establish that there was likely a non-zero number of crucifixion victims who were given proper burial. What it does not do is establish the practice as the default case, or even most common, or even common. Josephus remarks that during peacetime, the Romans did not require the Jewish people to violate their laws and customs. That's from against Appian uh, 2.73. Okay, so here's against Appian 2.73. Moreover, Appian would lay a blot upon us, because we do not erect images to our emperors, as if those emperors did not know this before, or stood in need of Appian as their defender, whereas he ought rather to have admired the magnanimity and modesty of the Romans, whereby they do not compel those that are subject to them to transgress the laws of their countries, but are willing to receive the honors due to them after such a manner as to those who are to pay them esteem, consistent with piety and with their own laws. For they do not thank people for conferring honors upon them when they are compelled by violence to do so. This passage is clearly talking specifically about the ongoing graven image conflict that we'd already talked about with Pilate. First the banners of images, then the golden shields without images, but words, which ended in bloodshed, and the Jewish laws in this context. For Craig to pluck out the phrase, they do not compel those that are subject to them to transgress the laws of their countries, when it's referring to emperor worship, and assume it applies to all laws, is a stretch beyond what the passage conveys. Does Dr. Craig imagine that Jewish prohibition against work on the Sabbath meant that all the Roman soldiers in Jerusalem got Saturday off? Certainly not. This limited accommodation cannot extrapolate across the board. Uh, and I would mention as well that we actually have archaeological evidence that uh, victims of crucifixion in Judea were properly interred in a tomb, uh, there was an archaeological discovery of a man named Yehoiakim, which uh, still had the crucifixion nail in the ankles with a piece of wood from the uh, cross affixed to it because apparently the nail had hit a knot in the wood and bent so that it could not be extracted. And the fact that this was preserved shows that the body was put into uh, a tomb where the flesh would decay, and then it was placed into an ossuary or bone box. Small correction that no wood from a cross was involved in this discovery, so I'm not sure what Craig is referencing there. But Yehohanan is a real thing we've discussed here before. For the sake of brevity, I'll merely grant it appears to be a 1st or 2nd century crucifixion victim in Jerusalem, who was given full, proper, remember it later, burial. I've already conceded that there is a non-zero number of such people in history based on the other accounts. Does this lone find somehow shift it rarely happens to it usually happens? I don't see how. And he says these are not the only evidence for the proper burial of a victim of crucifixion. The remains of a man, both crucified and beheaded, were recovered from what is now called the Abba Cave, once again in the Jerusalem neighborhood of Givat HaMishtar. Nails were recovered from the ossuary. One nail was still embedded in the man's hand. Again, too long to get into here, but in the original paper describing the find, it says the nails did not penetrate the bone. It would not seem, therefore, that this can be considered evidence of crucifixion. A later advocate for crucifixion diagnosis, Joseph Zayas, reappraised his position in 1985 and now calls the data inconclusive. In short, 
This example is too weak for most apologists to even bring up. All I can point to is general Roman practice outside of Judea, um, but doesn't draw the relevant comparisons in uh, first century Israel. I think what we've demonstrated here, until new documents are discovered, that what happened in Jerusalem is going to have to fall to inference and speculation. Craig wants to speculate that Judea didn't follow the rules. And I see insufficient justification for this. So we have literary evidence as well as archaeological evidence that in Judea during peacetime, um, the Romans respected the Jewish custom of immediate burial of crucified victims on the day of crucifixion. We absolutely cannot reach this conclusion based on the literary and archaeological evidence that Craig puts forth. At best, we can say that some first century Jerusalem crucifixion victims received a burial at a remembered location. The appeals to possible reasons for exceptions do nothing at all to dissuade us from thinking the general case isn't still the most likely case to apply. And the dirty little secret here is that even if Craig had shown that the Romans allowed each and every crucifixion victim to be taken off the cross by sundown, that alone doesn't get us to Craig's necessary conclusion that Jesus' body was somewhere easily accessible and remembered. As I mentioned, Jews also used unmarked ditch graves. Dr. Craig needs a personal, later identifiable, later remembered grave, or better yet, a tomb for easy access for the Jesus resurrection narrative to make sense. But I had my chance for my side. Let's let Bill make his case. As we just saw from the literary and archaeological evidence, Jesus was not the exception to the rule. Taking the bodies down and burying them on the day of crucifixion was the rule that was followed in Judea. We do not know that. That was not shown. Carry on. Moreover, uh, the reason that Jesus was treated that way, or the reason we should think he was treated that way, is not because he was the Son of God. Rather, it's because we have very good reasons to believe that the burial narrative is credible. Again, with credible. If all you want to say is the burial narrative isn't impossible, I can give you that. But I'm here to evaluate what's most likely. Credible is what you serve to an audience desperately clinging to a conclusion, not to convince a skeptic. Uh, and therefore, the vast majority of scholars, virtually all New Testament scholars, agree that the burial story uh, of Jesus' uh, corpse in the tomb by Joseph is historical. By far and away, uh, most scholars are convinced that in Jesus' case, the body was not left on the cross, but it was taken down and interred in a tomb. And it is evidence that has convinced virtually all scholars uh, today. As long as most of the jobs in New Testament scholarship are at academic institutions that require one to sign a statement of faith that the Bible is accurate, it's going to be entirely meaningless to say that the majority of New Testament scholars affirm the Bible is accurate on a particular story point. More respect goes to Habermas and Lycona here, who don't make Craig's unsubstantiated claim that virtually all scholars are convinced. By far, the majority of scholars who grant the empty tomb are Christian scholars. Um, and it doesn't come up to the level, even though it's a majority, if it's around 75%, that's a pretty strong majority. But I like it to be 90% or more for what I'm doing here, a nine, you know, for, for my criteria for accepting something as historical bedrock. So it didn't quite make a strong enough majority, and it's certainly not a robust hetero, heterogeneity of scholarship. Um, that is granting it. Not a robust heterogeneity of scholarship is code for Christians accept it, but skeptics do not. Rather than trying to settle this with an appeal to authority show of hands, 
perhaps Dr. Craig should just stick to his evidence. We have multiple independent attestation in at least five different sources, some of which are among the earliest in the New Testament, uh, such as the pre-Pauline formula quoted in 1 Corinthians 15 and the pre-Mark and Passion story. And this is one of the best tests of historicity is to have multiple independent and early uh, testimony to a, a particular event. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Dr. Craig doesn't tell us in this interview what all five sources are, but fortunately I have a copy of his book, Reasonable Faith. We've got the Creed in 1 Corinthians 15, pre-Mark and Passion narrative, the source behind Matthew, the source behind Luke, the Gospel of John. Let's start with 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried. That's it. That's all it says about the body disposal. Craig's book rightfully asks, but, we might wonder, was the burial mentioned by Paul the same event as the burial by Joseph of Arimathea? He points to the fact that the later sources echoes a died, buried, raised, appeared pattern as his evidence. This is absolutely ludicrous if we are to believe the notion that this passage represents a creed that would have been ubiquitously memorized by early church communities, and to accept the reality that Paul's record of it was circulating in churches for decades before the Gospels were written. Of course, the later accounts are going to follow the pattern of the first account. The sequel can't affirm the accounts of the original, and allow me to point to the elephant in the room. He was buried doesn't point to an individual remembered stone-cut tomb. The Greek word here, etaphe, was used by other Jewish writers around Jesus' time to mean anything from a rich man's tomb to a plot burial to a ditch burial. Frankly, it doesn't even say he was down by nightfall. 1 Corinthians 15 is the earliest relevant source, and it sheds no light on the plight of Jesus' body. Now, as to the Gospels, the author of Mark wrote the earliest extant Jewish burial narrative. The authors of Matthew and Luke copied Mark's burial narrative. Dr. Craig knows this, and he affirms it in his book. So, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version of this story are not independent. Craig imagines that because Matthew and Luke embellish Mark a little, that the latter had sources other than Mark alone. I don't have time to get into it here, but go read for yourself the Joseph of Arimathea story, first in Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, then John. The story grows in exactly the way you'd expect if each subsequent author is responding to new polemics, scrambling to keep the narrative plausible under increased scrutiny. By Occam's razor, there's no reason to posit hypothetical sources when editorial changes fully explain what we see. Dr. Craig's book asserts that these differences are not plausibly explained as Matthew and Luke's editorial changes of Mark, a statement backed by such formidable challenges as uneven editorializing, leaving parts out, and two places where Matthew and Luke made the same change. Dr. Craig and I are going to have to agree to disagree on plausibility, because that's all easily explained by an editorial hand. And even granting this speculative notion, how could we know if Craig's hypothetical isn't also merely dependent on the pre Markan narrative? In the same paragraph, Craig acknowledges the explanatory power of the narratives emerging from a common oral tradition, basically jettisoning his own independence claim. As for the Gospel of John, here are a handful of scholars who, to one extent or another, acknowledge that John is dependent on Mark. To suggest that the author of John was unaware of the other Gospels, is quite preposterous. So, of Craig's five allegedly independent sources for burial details, the first has no burial details, and the rest are inextricably dependent on each other. Not good. That's not it, Chief. Joseph of Arimathea is best explained as starting from a single source, be it written or common oral tradition, followed by periods of legendary development. In literary analysis, a catalytic character is one that catalyzes or propels parts of the plot before disappearing. Their purpose is to incite specific events or changes without lingering in the story. Joseph of Arimathea is a 
prototypical catalytic character. So I did also want to mention, in addition to that, we've got an article on capturing Christianity that was written by uh, what is now an anonymous author, uh, but it's outlining nine reasons why Joseph of Arimathea was a real historical figure. Uh, it outlines nine different reasons. We're not going to go through all of these reasons right now, but you can kind of see them. If you want to, you can pause the video. I'm not going to respond to these reasons right now, but you can pause the video and have a look at them. Moreover, the burial of Jesus by a member of the Sanhedrin rather than by his beloved disciples or by his family is unexpected and therefore very unlikely to have uh, been a fictional or legendary creation in the early Christian community. The burial of Jesus by a Jewish Sanhedrist uh, is unlikely to be a Christian invention. This is the criterion of embarrassment at work. The part that's allegedly embarrassing here is that Jesus didn't have family or friends asking for his body. And maybe that part is a true historical kernel. Fine. But if we're to believe that all bodies were removed by sunset, then someone is taking care of those without family or friends. Did the thieves beside Jesus have family and friends asking for them? Jesus can't be the first time a criminal was abandoned. It wouldn't have been the Romans rushing to bury them, because they wouldn't have cared about the sunset deadline. If this whole narrative of Craig's is correct, then there would have had to have been a procedure in place. And that procedure would very plausibly be the Sanhedrin. It needn't have been invented ad hoc here. In fact, Acts 13 preserves what some think is an earlier alternative burial account. In verse 29, they lay him in a tomb. And that plural they refers to those who condemned Jesus. So in this passage, the hostile Jewish leadership buries Jesus. In other words, the Sanhedrin, not a friendly Joseph of Arimathea. And here's the problem for Craig. In Mishnah Sanhedrin, Tractate 6.5, and other passages in the Talmud and Semaho, the Sanhedrin had two designated burying places for criminals. This Sanhedrin tradition is no good for Christians, because Jesus would have ended up somewhere unmarked where no one could find him. Something that would be an embarrassment to the early Christian movement is likely to be historical because it's unlikely to be made up. It's absolutely likely to be made up. They had to invent precisely this figure. Let's take a look at a little narrative flowchart. Was Jesus buried in a remembered tomb? Was Jesus buried at all? If no, then no tomb. If yes, then who buried Jesus? If it was the Romans, mass grave at best, no tomb. If it was family and friends, they were poor and uninfluential, so ditch grave, no tomb. If it was Jewish enemies, criminal burial ground, no tomb. But what if it was a rich Jewish friend? Then you could have a tomb. <laughs> Sounds like an ad hoc solution to polemic problems to me. The only scenario where Jesus lands in a tomb, and ideologically that has to happen for there to be an empty tomb narrative to support a bodily resurrection narrative, Joseph of Arimathea, embarrassing or not, is a necessary plot point. For these reasons, um, the evidence in favor of Jesus' burial has convinced uh, virtually all New Testament scholars. Dr. Craig's positive evidence for a locatable tomb of Jesus has completely failed to convince me. One ideologically motivated and narrative mandated story, some embarrassment that Jesus' family didn't claim him, and a non-heterogeneous consensus of vocationally mandated believers. Ultimately, this is a long way of saying Jesus was buried, for the Bible tells me so. But the argument then is, if the gospel narratives are correct, then the gospel narratives are correct. And so that's not an argument. What you're doing, if you're reading the Gospels and you're believing it because it's in the Gospels, what you're doing is you're treating the Gospels as testimony. And that's a completely normal thing to do. But that's the point. It's not that we don't think testimony can carry weight. It's that we aren't treating the Gospels as testimony. That's a completely normal thing to do. And that's Bart's point. If you already think this is testimony, then you're just going to take it at face value. And this whole conversation need not take place. First, the apologist needs to convince us that it is testimony. First, prove it's testimony, 
and we'll have a whole different discussion. So, like, um, suppose that you hear uh, you're you're a uh, a juror in a court case, okay, and you hear, and all that's available is the testimony of someone who is sexually assaulted, and that's all the evidence that you have to go on. In that case, like, would it be circular to rely on the testimony of the person who is claiming that they were assaulted? Uh, no, that wouldn't be circular at all. You'd be relying on the testimonies. In Cameron's scenario, there's no question as to whether the propositions to be evaluated represent testimony. The person is literally there in front of the jury's eyes providing it, probably also recorded and transcribed for future scrutiny. And there's someone there providing rigorous cross-examination. This is entirely disanalogous to the Gospels. The Gospels are an anonymous note about an assault, written on a napkin of unknown provenance. Do you believe the napkin or not? Again, convince me that the Bible is testimony, and you can sway me on this burial thing. Miracles might be another matter, but that's not the topic today. Let's sum up. This is the first century Roman Empire. Christians and non-Christian historians alike agree that in all the parts in red, the most common practice was to leave crucifixion victims hanging and then eventually set them on fire or toss them in a mass grave. For this one province, Judea, we admittedly don't have any explicit surviving record about what happened to crucifixion victims. Since all we have is silence, is it more reasonable to think that what usually happened everywhere else, under the same government, also happened here? Or is it more reasonable to think that under an openly hostile governor, the very people the state wanted to humiliate with crucifixion were at the last minute given a very honorable burial, and not just as a sometimes exception, but as the rule? Taking the bodies down and burying them on the day of crucifixion was the rule that was followed in Judea. I'm not saying Jesus couldn't have been an exception to the rule. Maybe he was. But to go so far as to insist Judea was policy opposite land because the subjugated people would have been happier and some fragments of exception claims from other regions in other times is not only a complete double standard in dealing with my case, it also strains academic credulity far beyond what anyone should expect from someone with the reputation of Dr. Craig. Christians. We know there was at least one exception, so just argue that Jesus was an exception. Make it easier on yourselves. I really wish this could have been a multi-hour video, because I have so much more to say on this topic, it could fill a book, or at least a chapter of a book. What do you think? Should I fill a chapter of a book? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, the rest of us will realize that when Jesus was buried doesn't ultimately matter for the resurrection case. It's where and by whom. If it were the Romans, hostile Jews, or a humble family, Jesus' body would have landed somewhere unidentifiable. But that's not compelling if you want to convince people he rose from the dead. For that, you need an empty tomb. And that ideological narrative necessity makes this uncorroborated, unlikely, evolving exception Joseph of Arimathea pitch seem far less likely than the natural alternative that what happened to Jesus was simply what happened to most crucifixion victims. They ended up somewhere unmarked and forgotten. Outside of compelling evidence otherwise, I'm well justified in assuming that what usually happens is what happened. If you want to see more of my responses to Dr. Craig, including some back and forth, tap on the thumbnail on screen now for the Apologia vs. William Lane Craig playlist, and I'll see you over there. Thank you so much to my patrons, whose support I count on to make this channel possible. Thank you to all. Later.